Just nothing else matters, right? <laughs> I felt this morning that uh, we're going to receive our offerings in just a minute or two, but I felt like God wanted me to share. Uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be going to Israel, uh, Pastor Karen and I. And uh, on the way back, we're visiting family in Sweden. Our daughter lives there and her husband and five children. So it'll be a good time of family reunion. But we're really going to Israel for the uh, Jerusalem prayer breakfast. Um, Last year, just quite by accident, I guess, as they would say in the world, um, we wanted to visit a friend in Jerusalem that uh, lives there. He's emigrated there. He used to be our interpreter when we went to Russia with Dr. Lester Summer all over the years and uh, has become really just a a great, great friend, a great prayer partner. And uh, the only day he had available, we went to see him and he was in a meeting with a member of the Knesset and his staff because they asked him if he would head up the Jerusalem prayer breakfast concept and model it after the Congressional Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. that's held every year in February. And so we just happened to be there on that day after lunch. And um, so he said, I'd like you to meet the, the member of Knesset. And I said, well, that'd be great, but he's probably a busy guy. So anyway, he, he introduced us. It was just a brief meeting and didn't get to know him or anything, just uh, worked with some of his staff members, and they were asking me for some recommendations of some pastors from America to invite to this breakfast. And then a couple of months later, I got a letter asking me if I would be part of the founder's circle of the prayer breakfast. (laughs) I'm going, who, me? Are you kidding? (laughs) Um, But it happened, and so we're going, we're invited, so... On June 6th, we'll be at a reception at the Knesset. And there's a number of kind of addresses there at the Knesset building. Then on the 7th is the Jerusalem prayer breakfast. And um, also a founder's dinner. And also a meeting with the president of Israel, a reception at his house. So... um, What an awesome opportunity just to represent Jesus. And they're asking for Christians and believers to come into Jerusalem and to show the Jewish people that there are people in America that really care about Israel. I mean, that's the whole thing. Um, In his letter to me, uh, Pastor Albert said, um, more than 500 delegates have registered from 55 nations. Um, among whom we have Christian politicians, pastors, and leaders of large movements, businessmen, media people, and people from all other walks of life. Um, So, needless to say, we're really, really looking forward to this. And then also we get to be with Pastor Israel Pochter again, ministering in the um, Beit Hillel churches, the the churches that he's he's founded, and uh, we've been invited to speak at their newest church again, uh, Pastor Igor and Natalie, and uh, just a really, really great couple. I love this young couple, and uh, so we're looking forward to ministering in their church. Last time we were there, we we just had an hour. That's all we could do because I was supposed to speak at the other church too, and then it turned into kind of an encouragement time for one of them, one of the pastors who lost his wife to, to cancer. So. Uh, we're really looking forward to this trip. Anyway, I'm saying all of that just because I felt like God wanted me to share that with you so that you can pray with us. You're our partners. You're our, you've got our backs. And uh, while we're gone, uh, Sarah will be ministering. And um, also my brother Don will be coming for one of the Sundays uh, to minister. And uh, so um, uh, Greg and Sarah will be heading up our plans for The Revive Outreach on the 18th. We'll be back for that, actually, but we'll just be coming back the day before. So we're we're so grateful that we have partners in this church family that are 
not just holding the fort, but just going forward with God. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So um, I'm not asking for any offerings or anything like that, but if you want to sow seed towards that, you're, you're welcome to do that. Um, our connection with the church in Israel is growing stronger and stronger and stronger, and we're still exploring kind of you know what that relationship should look like. We, um, I mean, it doesn't make sense at all. I mean, just the whole thing is really crazy. But God put this all together, so we're just we're just going for the ride, you know. So it's really really awesome. Um, but I do want to speak to you just from the Word of God this morning. We've been talking about keeping the windows of heaven open, and uh, <clears throat> usually, you know, when pastors talk about money and offerings and things like that. It's like they want to get in my pocket. But this is not about getting in your pocket. This is what God wants to speak today. And um, I I want to talk to you just for a couple of minutes about something that we don't like to talk about. And that's that every offering is not always accepted by God. You know, the Bible teaches us, you know, you remember the story of Cain and Abel? Um. Cain and Abel both brought offerings, and it seemed like the first fruits of their labors, but Abel's was accepted and Cain's was not. And uh, Cain ended up killing his brother out of jealousy over an offering. It wouldn't have been much nicer ending if he just said, you know, he's my brother, and I can get over this. And God will help me. Thank you. Um, But he didn't. Instead, he rose up and the first murder of the Bible was recorded. Um, In the book of Amos, it says, Though you offer me burnt offerings, this is Amos 5.22, Though you offer me burnt offerings and meat offerings, I will not accept them. So, Sometimes God doesn't accept offerings. So what that what that spoke to me is, you know, if God doesn't accept the offering, there must be something we can do about it if He's talking about it. And thankfully, there are there is a scripture in the Bible that helps us in this. Um, you know, the the obvious is is the church will receive whatever you give, no matter what. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> But the church doesn't promise to multiply your offering back to you. (laughs) You know, sometimes people come to us for help and they want a loan. And I don't know how many times I've told people, you know, this is a church, it's not the bank. If you want a loan, go to the bank. If, If I have, and God speaks to us about giving to you, We'll help you and give to you, but we're not making loans to anybody. So we can't promise to multiply your seed sown, but God has promised to multiply your seed sown. So the help comes in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12, with having offerings accepted. He said, for if there first be a willing mind, it, in other words, the offering, is accepted according to what a man has and not according to what he doesn't have. So when I was looking at that, I was thinking, the first thing that just kind of strikes you is if there's a willing mind. And I think it's not just talking about a willing mind, I'm willing to do this, but a a willing heart, really. Um, A sense inside that, you know, I'm not giving because I have to or because there's some kind of need. I'm I'm just willing to do anything God asks me to do, number one. And number two, I really love him. And I care about his kingdom and I care about his work. And therefore, I, I'm willing. So the second thing is, is, then it says, acceptable offerings are, I'm paraphrasing here, are given to God according to the blessings in your life. He said, it's it, the offering, is accepted according to what a man has. 
not according to what he doesn't have. So God isn't asking for what you don't have. There's only one case in the Bible where people that I know of that people gave beyond their ability to give where they probably had to borrow to give and that was the Philippian Christians and they did it on a word from the Lord. But everywhere else, the Bible teaches to give out of what you have, to sow out of what you have. So if that's what makes an offering acceptable then if we have a willing heart, a willing mind, and we give according to what we have, God's blessing is on it and he accepts the offering. Unacceptable offerings are given according to that which you don't have. In other words, let me kind of paraphrase this. The offering is not accepted if given according to your shortage. Because a lot of times people think this way if I have anything left over I'm going to give it to God and God's not into leftovers (laughs) so if we just switch our thinking and say you know what God has blessed me I can be a blessing according to what I have so if he's blessed me a huge amount I can willingly give a huge amount because he's blessed me. But even if it's just a small amount of blessing that I have, God's not looking at the size. He's looking at my heart. He's looking at my willingness. He's looking at my ability to use the resources he's given me and so according to that. So many times we think, I want God to do this for me. But God's looking to us and saying, what did I tell you to do? And when we do what he tells us to do, there's blessing there. There's multiplication there. That's why the Bible calls it seed sowing. It gives us seed to sow and bread for food and multiplies our seed that's sown. Not the seed that we keep, but the seed that we sow. Amen? And you get to determine it. And there's no pressure. (laughs) Because God loves a cheerful giver. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So this morning as we bring our tithes and offerings, let's just be thankful to God that we live in a place of blessing. I've been reading about the nation of Venezuela. It's really, really on my heart that in a few days, maybe in a month, maybe in two months, we're going to really, really need to help those people. Their kids are dying. They're eating grass and bark. Uh, Families, their hearts are broken. The system is broken. The government is bankrupt. And they're living under tremendous, tremendous pressure. And uh, somebody's going to need to reach out and help them. So we should be thankful. (laughs) Because we live in a place of blessing. And we're blessed to be a blessing. So let's stand and pray over our offerings this morning. Father, thanks for blessing us to be a blessing. Thanks for precious anointing that destroys yokes and lifts burdens. And thank you for multiplication of the seed that we sow this morning. And thank you, Lord, for your goodness in Jesus' name. So let's just say these words together. Lord Jesus, Jesus. today, I have a willing mind. I have a willing heart. Freely and willingly. I'm sowing my seed today. And I'm in expectation of all the great things you said in your word. Because those things are not just promises. They're reality. They're fact in my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you can be seated. And Sister Sister Mew is going to collect the offering. Grow. Grow in Jesus' name. Okay. So the Holy Spirit has everything backwards today.
Oh, it wasn't him? Okay. All right, he's got it right. I had it all wrong on my agenda. So um, I'm going to ask Sarah to come back up here for a second. And you, you guys back there ready to record? Because the message starts now. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, I asked Sarah to come up because um, she and Greg were leading the um, the revived training yesterday and uh, testimonies, and so she had to she had to hear it in English and speak it in Spanish. So I figured if anybody knew what went on yesterday, Sarah knows what went on. Well, sometimes that's not the case. I just spit it out and then I go, "What was that?" No. Okay. So just briefly, you know, maybe a minute or two, just give me your impressions of yesterday, the outreach. Just. Kind of like a summary. One word, awesome. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> you get you get a little or you get a lot. Because <laughs> it was just awesome. Um, I think the first thing that really touched me, well, a lot of people came yesterday. We had invited lots of people and also um, just put... I guess Greg announced it on the, uh, the Facebook and um, the Revive Fort Wayne page. And many people the last couple times have just been coming, not knowing us or not having any connection or friends that belong here, but just coming because they see it. Um, so that's really awesome that um, to partner with the church. And so yesterday we also had a group of um, believers from... Principe de Paz, a church out south on Hessen Castle, and so Pastor Ivan and two of his, um, two of the people from that church were here, um, Spanish speakers, so it just, and then other people, and it was just, yeah, it was just a blessing to have the diversity of the body of Christ come together and um, listen to God and go out and <laughs> make adventures. Okay, or live out the walk out the adventures that God already had. I better said. And so, I guess if you look at the results, we had some really pretty awesome things happen too. Yes, right? awesome things. I think many many seeds were planted. We did lots of gardening yesterday, um, spiritual gardening. Lots of seeds were planted, um, and four people gave their lives to the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And. Um, So those four and then three additional people, well, four additional people, so that's math, eight in total, um, want follow-up and discipleship. So praise God. Wow. It was awesome. And I I heard somebody was asking for baptism, too. I mean, just inquiring about could we we baptize them? A woman that um, Mew and I were speaking with at the subway over on Illinois Road that's connected with the Shell gas station. Um, Is she the lady with all the tattoos? No. Okay. Did she have tattoos? No. I don't know. <laughs> okay. No, I don't think so. It's the um, only lady I was... in there that I've been talking to. Oh, really? When I go in there, yeah. Must be another. Another employee. I yeah. guess God has his, has the number number of the subway workers there. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, it started in the morning because I, in the morning when I was at home and just asking the Lord for, you know, something for the day or Whatnot, I, I felt like the name Shelly, Shell, Michelle, Rochelle, there could be oh, lots of names with that, right? And so then we, when we prayed, um, it was Mew and the team, Mew and myself and Pastor Yvonne, and we prayed, and it was like, ding, it just like cleared up for me. It was the Shell gas station. And then I was like, so where's the Shell? I don't even know where the Shell gas station is. Like, no, it's not Michelle or Rochelle or any of that. Shelly, it's the Shell gas station. So we look, you know, we Googled, um, thank God for technology on our phones, everything at our fingertips. And like, well, there's one on Sherman and state, or there's one over here on Illinois. We're like, which one? And Pastor Yvonne is like, we can do both. So I was like, well, quick, because I have to turn. So I did this quick right turn, like, okay, we're going to Illinois road. And that's, um, that's what God had planned. So, wow. um, so yeah, the, this woman um, 
get all the names mixed up. No, but the woman that was asking, Samantha was asking for, um, about baptism. Like she, we didn't even get to ask what we could pray for her. Cause we started with her coworker and we got interrupted cause people were coming in and out to get sandwiches. But, but then, so then the, then this other Samantha came over and she just like started sharing with us and telling us about her, her mother and, and different things. And so, and then just said, do you guys know of a place where I can get baptized? (laughs) No. Well, (laughs) no, we don't know. (laughs) So, but we talked to her about, um, in other words, discipleship. I didn't say discipleship to her, but, well, I'd love to, you know, stay connected with you and let's get together and talk about that a little bit more. And then we can dunk you like kind of a thing, you know, (laughs) to, you know, to see the motive of her heart behind that. But, Actually, we bought sandwiches there for Revive Outreaches before. Yes. So I've gone back there, and they know my uh, father's right. house from that because they have our little tax-exempt receipt there right. ready to go. So mm-hmm. Praise the Lord. Praise God. It was good. All right. Any other quick highlights or um, things that struck you? A team, um, Greg's team and Beth, Greg and Beth, and I'm not sure who else was on that team. Mary, Beth, Mary, Beth and Thomas. Um, went to Kara's house, ended up at Kara's house, and they did like a loudspeaker announcement. Does anyone want prayer? Come on down, kind of a thing. It was like blaring and loud, and they weren't quite expecting that. And But praise God. And so um, that's like the voice of wisdom calling out to people, right? Like, come on down. <laughs> wisdom is here. Amen. And so they gathered with a group into another room. And um, it's my understanding that one um, young woman gave her heart to the Lord. And, and some of the other ones want follow-up and uh, discipleship. So, All right. Praise, praise God. God. Well, yeah. thanks for sharing. You're welcome. <laughs> You can sit down now. Okay. There's an addition to that. In just house. an addition to the Karis house is because of what we did, just following the prompting of the Holy Spirit, the ladies at the front desk, she gave me their business card, and she said all we need to do is contact her, and they will actually set up a time for us to come. If we want to come several times a month, several times a week, whatever, they said they could fill their um, – lunchroom with 50 to 100 young ladies to just share the gospel any time we want. Wow. God is good. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. So I asked them to do that because it really kind of fits with my message today. I want to speak to you for a few minutes about fellowship or family. And if you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter, I want to start there really just to kind of introduce the subject and then we'll hopefully move fairly quickly through this, but um, Matthew chapter 16, verse 15, it says, he asked them, but who do you say I am? Because Jesus was asking, you know, who does, who do they say that I am? You know, who, who, who do people think that I am? And so Peter, verse 16 says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Yeshua replied, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed. No human has revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven revealed it to you. You are Peter, and I can guarantee that on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you imprison, God will imprison. Whatever you set free, God will set free. I think that's really an awesome translation. It's Names of God translation. This is a little different than some of the other translations, but it really brings out a point. And in the footnote, it had this, uh, this statement. It says, in the Greek, there's a little play on words between Petros, which is the, the Greek for Peter, uh, or pebble, uh, uh, Pet, uh, P- Peter is the pebble and Petra, which is the rock. So it says there's a play on words, Petros and Petra. Peter is the pebble and Petra is the rock. So really from that, I think we can see that 
It wasn't talking about Peter being the rock. It was talking about the revelation that Peter had being the rock. And so Jesus said, the point I want to make out of all of that is that Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. Everybody say he's going to build it. Now, there's another place that says, if the Lord doesn't, if the Lord doesn't build the house, you labor in vain. You know, so <laughs> we better be looking for what he's building. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So the question I was asking out of that was, how did that play out when Jesus left and left the work of the ministry to his disciples? What happened after he left that made the church work? And so I want to I want to talk to you about that today, and it's got I have three quick points. So hopefully, I can make them quickly. But as we get into that, I'd like to look at Mark chapter sixteen. Just take a look at the book uh, for a few minutes, and then get into those three points uh, about it. In Mark chapter sixteen, in verse nine, it says, "After Yeshua came back to life early on Sunday." So this is talking about his resurrection. He appeared to Mary from Magdala, from whom he had forced out seven demons. She went and told his friends who were grieving and crying. They didn't believe her when she heard that he was alive and that she had seen him. But later, Yeshua appeared to two disciples as they were walking home in the country. He did not look as he usually did, so they went back and told the others who did not believe them either. Still later... Yeshua appeared to the eleven apostles while they were eating. He put them to shame for their unbelief, and because they were so stubborn to believe, uh, to, they were too stubborn to believe those who had seen him alive. Then Jesus said to them, "So, wherever you go in the world, tell everyone the good news. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved." Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And then we get to this part of verse 17. I think this is kind of what I want to focus on out of that setting is these are the miraculous signs that shall accompany believers. They will use the power and the authority of my name to force demons out of people. They will speak with new languages. They will pick up snakes, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will place their hands on the sick and cure them. Did you notice it didn't say they're going to just pray for the sick? It says they're going to put their hands on them and cure them. Wow. After talking with the apostles, the Lord was taken up to heaven where God gave him the highest position. And the disciples spread the good news everywhere. The Lord worked with them he confirmed his word by miraculous signs that accompanied it. So, the way the disciples handled this building of the church was they just stayed like normal people who were excited about what had happened to them, what they had seen, what they had heard, how Jesus had engaged them, how he had used them to do the work of the kingdom, how he had involved them in his ministry, and how he took them to another level of their walk with God. And amazingly, as they did normal things that normal people do, even when they were scattered out of Jerusalem, they just preached the good news everywhere. But here's the stumbling box. We think, I'm not a preacher. But this is not about you being a preacher. This is about you sharing good news. So what Sarah was saying just a little bit ago, and Greg, as we go out, we can we, we got some really, really awesome news that we can share with other folks. And if we'll just be normal, not weird, not charismaniac, not just out there people, if we just be normal people and share the good news, God will do something miraculous. The Bible says he will confirm his word with signs and miracles accompanying that word. So why do we get so weird about things? And why are we so afraid 
to do what he said to do. He gave us a commission. He gave us a job to do. And yet, I mean, I guess I'm nervous every time I go out. I mean, this is crazy. Why should it be easier to talk to people in this room than it is to talk to somebody out there when my talking to them could save them from hellfire, could save their life, could heal their sickness, could bring them back to a place with God? Why am I intimidated when I go out? This is crazy. All God's asking us to do is to be normal. He wants you to be you. But not you, just ordinary you. You with extraordinary extraordinary good news. News that's too good to be true. That's what the gospel is. So let's take a look beyond the book here. And I want to speak to you about three points about how Jesus builds a church. The first point is fellowship with all. You know, there's so many churches that are fighting against each other. There's so many Christians that are fighting with each other. There's so much contention in our nation about everything. It's just crazy. But in the book of Acts, in the second chapter, it's talking about just after the church was born. And I think it can give us some insight into fellowshipping with people. It says in verse 46, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, those who are being saved. Now, I think that's so nondescript. I mean, there's some, there's some pillars in there. There's some really good stuff in there, some good points about this is what church should look like, this is what family should look like, this is what relationships should look like. But, but it's so ordinary. They just continued daily with one accord. I mean, they just stayed in unity. They just were in the temple every day. That's pretty crazy, going to church every day, but hey. And they were breaking bread from house to house. Now, sometimes this is some, I think the living says they were doing communion, but I don't think so. I mean, they were doing a Shabbat meal together. (laughs) They were having meals together. Remember, these were Jewish people doing Jewish things, living like Jewish people, ordinary people, going about life, doing what Jewish people do. But... These were people who were now believers in Jesus Christ who were intentionally breaking bread together because they loved Jesus and they loved each other and they found a place of fellowship with each other. You can fellowship with everybody if you just put your pride down, if you just put your preconceptions down, if you can be, I guess shall we say, tolerant? (laughs) Maybe that's not politically correct. But they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. The daily life of a normal believer described here, gladness and simplicity. Does that describe your life? Or is your life upside down and very complicated? You know, most of the reasons that our lives are upside down and complicated is because you and I make them upside down and complicated. We could make some decisions that would simplify them a lot. But oftentimes we don't make those decisions and we have lots of reasons. Because nobody makes those decisions. That's crazy. Everybody does this. Yeah, but you're not everybody. You're in the army now. You're a believer in Jesus now. You're different now. You're other. You're exceptional. That's what sanctified mean. Other, different, not the same, changed. Amen? Bible says be holy, be sanctified because he's holy. He's different. He's other. He's like 
unexplainable. So you should be like him. He doesn't do all that stuff that hurts people. He doesn't steal from people. He doesn't commit adultery. He doesn't do any of that stuff. So we're supposed to just be like him because that's how he is. Amen. Now, I'll be the first to admit I don't keep that perfectly myself. And I'm preaching to me when I'm preaching to you. But we could simplify our lives greatly if we just followed him. Because he lived an ordinary, normal life. And that's what he was teaching his disciples to do. And when they got the chance to be the church, that's what they did. They said, you know what? We can go to temple. That was just normal Jewish worship. Remember, this temple was not Christian worship. So, I mean, they weren't going to the church with a steeple with a cross on it. That hadn't been invented yet. They were going to the temple where Jewish people worship God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Torah. And they would just be an ordinary Jewish people. And they were breaking bread from house to house. They were eating together. They were having meals together. They were sharing together the love of God that he was pouring into them through their knowledge of the Messiah. They were having gladness in their heart. You know, I think one of the biggest hindrances to being a witness for Jesus is our crazy depression. (laughs) Our insane being down all the time. These people were glad in their heart. They, They had lots of problems and troubles and situations and circumstances, but they had gladness of heart. Simplicity of heart. And they were praising God. Sometimes in spite of their circumstances. And they were having favor with the people. I wonder why. (laughs) Who wants to be around a bunch of depression? Amen. (laughs) So maybe if we just cheer it up a bit, you know, (laughs) we'd have more opportunities to really be a witness for Jesus because... Who wants to be around that stuff? I mean, you get that stuff at work. And then there's road rage. And then there's all this other stuff that's going on. And the crazy stuff in the media. Oh, my goodness. That'll make your day, right? Wow. So, remember that these people were Jewish. They didn't stop being Jewish because they accepted Jesus. They still had Shabbat meals together. They kept all of the festivals But they had found their Messiah. The other folks hadn't found him yet. But they did. And it changed their lives. And because it changed their lives, they could live like that. And people noticed that. And it drew people. They had favor with people. Maybe, just maybe, if we could fellowship with people, we'd have the same results. Do you think? Praise the Lord. And besides that, just... Sarah was talking about baptism a little bit today. They were baptized into the body of Christ. You know, John came with a baptism of repentance from sin. But these people were baptized into the body of Christ. They became believers in Jesus Christ. They were now part of a new family. And so when they did this thing together, it was powerful. It was uplifting. It was encouraging. It was a different kind of lifestyle than they experienced in just, uh, you know, serve God because they've got these commandments to do. Amen? And secondly, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. You should look through the book of Acts, how careful they were to make sure that everybody got filled with the Spirit. To, To them, it wasn't one of these optional things. It was essential because they even sent the apostles down to make them go get those people baptized in the Holy Ghost because they don't have it yet. They were saved. We know they were saved. There's great joy in the city in the book of Acts, the the 8th chapter, where Philip went to Samaria. And yet, Peter and John came down to make sure they got filled with the Holy Spirit. He must have thought that they needed something. Amen. Amen? So, they were on a mission. The mission described in Mark 16, 20, where they went out and preached the word and gave the word and shared the gospel, shared the good news, and God confirmed it. Okay, so... No wonder, 
because this is how Jesus left them. Turn to Luke 24, 44. Jesus said to them, These words I spoke to you while I was with you. I told you that everything written about me and Moses' teaching and the prophets and the Psalms had come true. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scripture. And he said to them, Scripture says Messiah would suffer, that he would come back on the, to life on the third day. Scripture also says that the authority of, in the authority of Yeshua, people would be told to turn to God and change the way they think and act so that their sins will be forgiven. Most of the time that's translated that people would repent. But it means they change how they think and how they act. Amen. This would be told to the people from all nations beginning in the city of Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. I'm sending you what my father promised. Wait here in the city until you receive power from heaven. Then Yeshua took them to a place near Bethany and he raised his hands and blessed them. That was their sending out and his sending off. And then they went out and did what I read to you in Acts 2.42. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, fellowship with everyone. We can fellowship with people. I don't have to believe everything other folks believe to have some fellowship. I can find some common ground around the cross, around the blood of Jesus, around the word of God. I don't have to criticize what they do and what they say and how they do it. Because I'm not the judge anyway. I can work together with other believers. I can be friends with the pastor, the Hispanic pastor across town. I don't even know him very well, but something's ticking when we're together. Because you can see the love of Jesus in him. We can fellowship with folks. Second thing, we can partner with some. In Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Don't you love that scripture? (laughs) But listen to what he says after that. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now, you Philippians know that at the beginning of the gospel, I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid more than once to my neediness. You see, by the time Paul had his encounter with Jesus, the church was already spreading throughout the Roman Empire. Wherever there were Jewish believers, he went and preached in the synagogues. He began his ministry going to the synagogues and was often rejected. So he saw a need to have some partners because It's like this. We can either hang together or we're going to hang separately. When you're under fire, you better have some brothers and sisters with you, some partners, some people who've got your back. So he began his ministry that way, and he carried inside him this revelation that the gospel was not for Jewish people only, but for the Gentiles. He told Felix, or told uh, Agrippa, the governor, the king, Uh, In Acts chapter 26, he said that he said to Jesus, Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting, but rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness of both the things which you have seen and the things which I will reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I send you. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance with those who are sanctified through faith in me. So, then he said to King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He carried that vision inside of him day and night. And he discovered that he could partner with some folks to advance the kingdom of God amongst the Gentiles. He needed partnerships. So you can partner with some people. Some people you can just fellowship with, but some people you can partner with. And those Philippians, they went beyond themselves to help him. In Second Corinthians chapter 8, it says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God of the churches in Macedonia. It's speaking about this Philippian church that in the great trial of affliction, 
The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. So out of stress, these people became a blessing to Paul. And they partnered with him. And he commended it. And he used them as an example of how churches should be a blessing to each other, how they could partner together to do some things. So if we're going to win the king, if we're going to win people to the kingdom, we can fellowship with everybody. We can fellowship with all and we can partner with them. But the reality is, is not everybody's going to partner with us, but we shouldn't be discouraged or disappointed or put out because of that. Because, you know, life goes on. We have an assignment. We have a mission. We have a commission. The commission is is to let Jesus build the church amongst us. And then the final point is this. You can build with sons and daughters. As Paul was going around building these churches, he discovered it wasn't enough just to have fellowship with folks, and it wasn't enough just to have partners. He really needed to have sons. In Acts chapter 20, verse 18, when he calls the Ephesian churches together, the churches in Asia, the elders together, He says in verse 18, You know that from the first day I came to Asia, in what manner I lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, humility, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but I proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and to Greeks repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. So this was the foundation of the message that Paul took to those churches of Asia. You know, the Bible says that in, in, in Acts chapter 19 and verse 20, it describes how he, how he went to Ephesus, and when he got kicked out of the synagogue, he pulled his disciples out, and he began to train them in a school of Tyrannus. And the Bible says he did that over the space of two years, and by the end of that time, all the people in the, in the province of Asia had heard the word of the Lord. I mean, it was amazing, amazing results. But he learned that though you could fellowship with everybody and you could partner with some, you could only build with sons. He raised up sons in that school of Tyrannus because he was discipling them and pouring into them. Everywhere he went, he encountered opposition, hardship, and persecution. But he soon learned that if he was going to get through it, he needed sons. In 1 Corinthians 4.15, he says... For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore I urge you, imitate me. For this reason I have sent to Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of, the, of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in the church. So you can see that he took this idea of sonship, this idea of discipleship, into every church that he planted. And that was the reason he could leave successful churches behind, because he had sons, he had daughters, he had people who were more than just partners. Praise the Lord. Um, In 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, he says, You, therefore... My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and in the things you have heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So he was expecting this sonship, this discipleship, this, this mentoring to go to another generation. He's saying, but I poured into you, find some faithful men who are able to teach others. So here's the point. When you're going out, you might not find faithful people. But if you can find hungry people and you can get them to bring them to Jesus and they get filled with the Holy Spirit, they can become faithful people who are able to teach others. And there you have multiplication and and, and reproduction, really, of what God is doing in your own life. That's what God's calling us to do. You know, Jesus didn't say, go make converts. He said, go make disciples. It's a little messy. It's a little tough. You know, because they hang up on you, you know, they don't answer your calls, they don't text you back, they don't do this, they don't do that, you know, they don't do everything you want them to do, or you hope they would do, or you've been praying they would do. But if you can find a hungry one, just maybe that's the one. Just maybe that's the two, or the five, or the however many you reach that way. Praise the Lord. 
in Philemon. Um, verse 8. Is there only one chapter in Philemon? Maybe. It says, Therefore, though I may be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for your love's sake I will appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the aged, now a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while I was in chains. So even at the end of his life, Paul was reaching out for sentence. He was looking for somebody to pour into. You know, Pastor Karen and I got saved that way because somebody wanted to pour into us the things of God. That's how we came to Jesus, and that's probably why we still have this in our hearts. Relationships are messy. You know, sometimes they had things with Barnabas. You know, they split. John Mark, he left the work. Freedom and independence, you know, versus submission and loyalty. I mean, it's a problem. It's an issue. We've had tons of people leave this church. <laughs> probably if we had them all since we've been here, we probably have 2,500 people that have been through the church. But it's not about that. It's about... Are we going to do what Jesus called us to do? Um, I'm sometimes ashamed that we don't have more than a handful. (laughs) Because I guess we haven't been very successful in finding the hungry ones. And that's probably not God's fault. But the ones who get it, get it. And uh, sometimes you don't see the results of your things that you do too because people go and they do things you know there has to be freedom if if people stay because they're not free you've got nothing if you corral people in and lock the door i tell you what you're going to have herding cats yes. because if people are not free they're not going to serve god and they're not going to serve you either so Jesus came to be Lord of the church and the head of the church. And if we let him, then we can succeed. Amen? Praise the Lord. So it's not my way or the highway, you know, with leadership. It's raising up sons and daughters that can do what God has called them to do. Jesus is the rock of revelation. And Peter answered, you are Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus is the head of the church, not me, not us, not you. And we can fellowship with all. We can partner with some, but we must build with sons. Amen? Praise the Lord. So we're going to break into some small groups here, and for a few minutes just, I'd say, cover at least one point, maybe the last one, and then um, and then we're going to pray and be dismissed because we've already had lots of things happen in the service. God bless you.